Thanks, Trey, for the intro. Uh, thanks, everyone at MIT Bitcoin Club for having me and for putting together this awesome event. Um, I'm here to talk about the future of payments, uh, but we're going to talk about a bunch of stuff as well. So a little bit about myself, Andre Nevis. I'm the CTO and co-founder at Zebedee. Uh, you can find information about us at zebedee.io. Zebedee is a gaming fintech. Uh, we build payments infrastructure for gamers and game developers. Uh, specifically, we build solutions based on Bitcoin, right? And, and when we're talking about payments in Bitcoin, we're talking about Lightning Network, right? And that's the payments network of, of Bitcoin. Um, so we provide solutions for gamers and game developers to essentially power their game rewards, their game points, their game economies with, with Bitcoin, with Lightning. Um, but I'm not here to talk about Zebedee, unfortunately. I'm here to talk about future of payments. Um, and before we can talk about the future of payments, we need to talk about the current state of payments. Right, so let's go through, and you know, everyone here knows these logos, right? We're talking Cash App, Chase, PayPal, Revolut. These are banks, neobanks, fintechs, payment service providers, right? I imagine each and every one of you here have one account in one of these, right? Um, and there's this illusion that all of them are interoperable, right? That, that you know, Cash App can send to Chase and PayPal and et cetera. And, and this illusion is mostly based on the fact that they're Providers that speak the same money language, right? They all speak dollars, for example. You could, you could change this to any fiat currency, but I'm using dollars as an example. Cash App speaks and understands the money language of the dollar. Chase speaks and understands the money language of the dollar. And the same thing with PayPal and Revolut. So it would feel and it would seem like a trivial thing to be able to send money from one to the other, right? They, they speak the same money. Um, but really, the ones making the transactions aren't the platforms themselves. It's, it's the users, right? Users interact with other users. Users interact with merchants. Users buy things online and sell things online. And so the users of Cash App and the users of Chase and the users of PayPal are the ones actually affecting transactions. And those are just the providers of those transactions, right? They're, they're the banks behind the scenes. Um, while the institutions enjoy the ability to move funds back and forth, that luxury is not given to the users, right? Cash, your, your $10 in Cash App is only valuable inside of the Cash App network. Your 50 bucks in Venmo is only valuable inside of 50 bucks uh, inside of the Venmo network. Um, you can't really send across providers. Sending money across providers has always been an extremely laborious and costly thing for users. Have you ever tried to do a global wire transfer? Like, how many days does that take? How many fees does that incur? <laughs> Right? So this is the current state of payments. This is, this is what we live in. And what happens is you have these siloed financial worlds. Right? You, have, you need to bring all of your friends into Cash App so you can transact with each other. You need to bring all your friends into Venmo to transact with one another. You can't interoperate even though you're all speaking dollars, even though you're all speaking the same, the same language here. Um, even in environments and jurisdictions and regions of the world where you do have some additional software, some additional interbanking systems, so for example, open banking in PSD2 in the EU, we have Zelle in the United States, and in Brazil, for example, we have the PIX network, which is backed by the Central Bank of Brazil. Uh, these are all interbank, interfintech settlement networks, right? And, and even though these are advancements and it's moving us in the right direction, um, there's no future in which a bank account, uh, in, in European bank account that's interoperable with open banking, can send and receive money to a US-based bank account using Zelle. Right? Like, even though we are beginning to get standards, these are regional standards. These are not global standards. And we now have global money, right? We have global money. And so what ends up happening is we have this world with large institutions, large corporations, large providers, uh, whose users cannot talk to one another. Right? And, and this is what I mean by siloed financial worlds, is um, you can't escape your cash app world. You have to find ways to spend that money in that network. Um, you can't easily send it to your friend through a Zelle interface. You can't easily send to your friend who has a Revolut account. Right? So this is the current state of payments. Um, but money is much bigger than just that. Right? Money has to be digital, it has to be instantaneous, and in this case, we want it to be global, right? We want the same money everywhere. And for that to occur, we need it to interoperate. It has to be interoperable, right? A world where money, global money is not interoperable, it is not the world we want to live in. Um, 
why can't you send money from Cash App to Revolut? It, it seems really simple, right? It seems like something, well, of course, Andre, you can't because Cash App is one platform and Revolut is the other platform. But take a second to think about it. They both speak dollars. Why can't I just you know, make, a, make a payment to Revolut? And it's because dollars and the USD network is a permissioned network, right? Cash App has its own traditional finance, financial institution banking integrations. Venmo has another set of integrations. Chase has its own. Revolut has its own. And this comes with lots of new features, but it also comes with technical implications, right? And essentially, a permissionless network that anyone can tap into, can connect to, and can integrate does not exist. And this is the same for all fiat-based monies, right? This is not just a dollar thing. This is euro. This is all of them. A permissionless network does not exist. But thankfully, Bitcoin does exist, right? And, and Bitcoin is global money, right? Uh, Bitcoin is the global money where one Bitcoin is the same one Bitcoin in Brazil, in South Africa, in India, in Australia, or any of the many countries in Europe. Um, and it's the same in the US as well. And, and Bitcoin is digital. It's digitally native. It's part of the internet. So it can be sent and received at the speed of the internet, similarly to how the internet turned information into data, Bitcoin turned money, value, into data, right? But Bitcoin is highly technical, it's highly complex, and it's now it's, it's multiple layers, right? It's not just layer one of Bitcoin, there's now lightning and there's many other things popping up. So let's walk through, now that we understand the current payment system of traditional finance, let's talk about the current flow of payments in lightning. OK, um, let's use the famous Alice paying Bob example. Alice wants to pay Bob, right? So great. Alice has to engage with Bob and say, Bob, I would like to pay you 500 Satoshis. Please give me a Lightning Network invoice. Bob goes into his wallet or his node, creates the invoice, sends it back to Alice. Alice can then scan that invoice, and then she can attempt to make the payment, right? And then at the very end of that, Bob receives the payment. Um, a few things to note, this is a highly interactive engagement here, right? Bob and Alice need to be there. You need to, hey, here's the invoice for you to pay, right? Um, both of these users have to be online. They have to, to be near each other. Um, and, and one way to think about it is, what if Alice wanted to pay Bob, Charlie, Dave, Eric, and you know, 10 more people? We're not talking about the same interaction 10 times, right? And, and, and that interaction is not the interaction we want to be at if we want folks to migrate from using current traditional finance to using a Bitcoin first world, right? Um, an example is if you're going down to the coffee shop and you're paying for your coffee, that's a fine interaction. It's a single time payment. You receive your coffee, you make the payment, and you're done, right? Another interaction is an e commerce website. You add a bunch of things to your cart, you click checkout, here's a QR code, you make the payment. These are fine. But in a world where Every single type of interaction can have a value attached to it, right? Data, money is now data. This does not scale. This does not cover every use case. I, I've just mentioned very briefly, if I want to send 10 payments to 10 different people, I need to engage with those 10 people, and they all need to send me invoices that I can then pay. So how do we make it better, right? What, what's, what's really the key uh, problem here when it comes to user experience? QR codes. QR codes are great. I actually love QR codes. Okay, they're, they're very useful, um, but they are not the future of a web-first programmable payment system. Okay? Um, they do not cover all scenarios, as I just mentioned. So I think what's important to highlight is user behavior changes are extremely hard to occur. You need to provide that 10 to 100x improvement in some facet of your protocol of your platform, of your application, of your service, to then attempt to make users change that behavior. So if, you, if we want folks to stop using Chase and Cash App and PayPal and using dollars, and we want them to use Bitcoin, right? we need to provide that baseline user experience that's currently available. If not, we need to provide even better user experiences. What if there was a better way? Right? What if instead of a bunch of QR codes left and right, what if instead of having this interactivity between the payer and the payee, what if instead of having one payer to one payee, you can do many payers to many payees, and, and this is you know, the future of what we're talking about? So before we do that, let's, let's 
try and learn from other parts of the internet stack and try and get some learnings from that and apply it elsewhere. So every single person here has an email address, right? I don't, this is a statement that I'm very sure I can make. And I'm also very sure that not everyone here uses the same email provider, right? But we can all send emails to each other. It's mind blowing, magical, right? And, and why is that? And that's because of a simple standard. It's a protocol called Simple Mail Transfer Protocol, SMTP. If you're technical, you may have heard of it. And so that's why Google and Gmail can send to Yahoo users, and Yahoo users can send to Outlook, and Outlook can send to ProtonMail. And this is just email, right? You can actually self-host your own email service, and you can be interoperable with all other email service providers. Right? That's, how it, that's how it works. Um, and what even is an email address? An email address is an internet identifier. There's a, it's an RFC 7522, et cetera. Um, and really what it is, it's just a way to reach a specific user inside of a given provider. So in the case of Gmail, if a user is Satoshi, to reach Satoshi, to send Satoshi messages, you would send him a message to following the protocol, and you would send it to satoshi at gmail.com. Right? And gmail.com is the email service provider. And you can do the same thing with yahoo.com, outlook.com, or any provider. I could even do it andre.com if I hosted it myself. Right? So in our industry, we're not dealing with emails here. We're dealing with payments. We're dealing with money. Right? So we don't have email service providers. We have what's known as lightning service providers, Bitcoin lightning service providers. And these are providers that give you, you know, the ability to transact with other users. They give you liquidity. They give you applications and services, platforms, whatever it may be. So let's learn what we took from, let's, let's take what we learned from emails and standards and let's pass that on to money. Like, can we actually apply any of those learnings to money? So let's think a little bit more. Instead of a email service provider, okay, now you have a lightning service provider. And similarly, if I'm trying to reach a user inside of that service provider, I have a identifier, Satoshi, and it's at Zebedee. In this case, this is our uh, domain for service provision there. And so instead of emails, right, which follow the SMTP protocol, you could send money to this lightning address, right, to this address. This is effectively what a lightning address is. Okay? This is a standard that was released late last year. It is open source, MIT licensed, um, and you can learn more at lightningaddress.com. But the, the idea here is that it is a massively simpler way for anyone to send you Bitcoin. Right? So the same way you just add your email address somewhere and folks can then send you messages, you can now add your lightning address and voila, folks can send you money. And because Bitcoin is global, this is, this is global, right? It doesn't matter if you're in Japan, in India, in China, Brazil, wherever. This is an internet identifier, right? It works everywhere. And what's amazing is that there's no company backing this standard or, or putting a bunch of marketing dollars on this. Um, Zebedee, my company, uses and consumes this open standard. But there are countless others, right? And ever since the release of this protocol in September of last year, we've seen wallets of all kinds, custodial and non-custodial, add support for one way or another in Lightning addresses. We've seen chatbots in Discord and Telegram and Twitch and Steam add support for it. Global exchanges have added support for it. Streaming and podcasting services have added support for it. Gift card companies, donations, video games, browser extensions, I can, I can keep going, right? These are just companies that whose users have either voiced to the companies, hey, we want this, or the providers themselves have realized that this provides a much superior, a much better user experience. Remember, we're, we're not competing against, against you know, early stages Bitcoin. We're competing against you know, tapping your Apple Watch on Starbucks and making that payment. Right? That's the competition here. So how do, we, you know, how do we make it better? And Lightning Address is one way to do just that. So what you get is now you can have Satoshi at Zebedee, which is a gaming fintech company. But you can also have Satoshi at BitRefill, which is a gift cards company. You can have Satoshi at Noah, which is a neobank. You can have Satoshi at Fountain, which is a podcasting service. You can have Satoshi at LN Markets, which is a derivatives exchange. 
And just like that, for the first time, my podcasting app and my bank speak to each other. Th think of what that means. Like, imagine sending money from Chase to Spotify. That seems unimaginable right now. Why would, how would I even do that, right? But all of that is now possible because all of these applications are simply adhering to an open standard, right? So let's go back to Alice and Bob. What, what is the experience of Alice and Bob? Whereas before, Alice had to get in touch with Bob and say, Bob, give me an invoice, and then Alice had to scan that. We can now just, hey, I know Bob's lightning address. It's bob at Zebedee GG. I'm going to set an amount. I'm going to set a lightning address, and I'm going to try and make a payment. And just like that, Bob is not even involved in the conversation. He just receives the payment, right? This is, this is not complicated. So if this plays. Here's an example of me making a payment right, over using the Zebedee browser extension. So I'm sending 1,000 Satoshis. And here I'm sending it to Sergey, the CEO of BitRefill, which is a gift cards company. right? And, and, the, and the system finds it because it adheres to the standard. But because it's just like emails, I'm actually sending multiple payments. And I'm sending it to myself, to my own BitRefill account. right? And then I'm also sending to Luis, who's the CEO of BIPA, which is a Brazilian-based exchange. Right? BitRefill is based in, in Europe. Zebedee is based in the US, Beepa is based in Brazil. And after I make the payment, you wait two seconds, and voila, I just made three payments globally, instantly settled using an open standard. No QR codes involved, no need for me to get in touch with these folks. That's, that's very, very powerful. You can now send Bitcoin worldwide the same way you send pay, uh, emails worldwide with the exact same user experience. I think that's the key. Everyone here knows how to send emails. Granted, everyone here should know how to send lightning address payments, right? Your grandma can send emails. She can send messages. She can probably now send payments worldwide. Bitcoin is global money. It's internet money. So let's go back to our, to our little diagram, right? We talked about institutions understanding the same money language, and yet, this illusion of interoperability between them exists, uh, and users are not afforded the ability to interact with one another. On a Bitcoin standard, and through the use of Lightning, Network pro uh, Lightning Address Protocol, this is where we are, right? Institutions are interoperable, but the users of those institutions are now interoperable with one another. John at Cash can send money to Peter at Chase. And they can send money to you know, Jack at PayPal. And they can send money to Brianna at Revolut. Right? These are all interoperable users, regardless of the provider. Magical. This, this, is, this is key. This is important. This is one of the most important properties of money, the ability to freely transact it with others who value it the same. Yeah, your $5 are the same as my $5. I just want to send it to you. right? Why is, why, why is that not easy? And there's a lot of power in standards. Uh, I imagine lots of folks here are technical. If you understand technical standards, they're very hard. Um, you, know, you, you put it out, and there it is. You know, the standard is out. Do you want to support it? Do you want to consume it? Do you want to understand it? Um, but when it is understood, right? when standards are adopted, and when network effects start to play out, um, what we get is examples like this. So Galoi is one of the companies uh, that creates software, community banking software for Bitcoin and Lightning. And they're one of the, the big proponents of the Bitcoin Beach uh, um, project in El Salvador. And uh, recently, they just made a tweet how they onboarded uh, a group called Jemmy Market, which is probably a small market in in El Salvador, and, and instead of QR codes, instead of you know, web pages, instead of anything, they just entered eli23 at bitcoinbeach.com. Right? That is a lightning address. Um, and they said send sats. Right? And just like that, people from around the world are now able to send sats and send money to this person. Right? This, they had no engagement. I sent money to Jimmy Market, and I had never even been to El Salvador. But I didn't need to interact with them. I didn't need to ask for invoices. I didn't need to get in touch with them. I just sent the same way I would send an email, just sent some payments. And because this is an interoperable payments protocol, and it's built on top of other interoperable networks like Lightning and Bitcoin, 
what you see on the right side are different wallets, web wallets, mobile wallets, desktop wallets. Right? These are just wallets that are understanding the same protocol. Very powerful. Another example, um, we go back to, to Zebedee here, shilling my own bags. So this is the Discord integration for Zebedee, where the same way I can send a message to my buddies on Discord, I can now send money. So I can send, enter my Lightning address, that I'm the destination, I enter the amount, and if I'd like to, I can send a comment alongside it. And just like that, I've sent 1,000 sats to Sergey. Sergey actually got a lot of money from me because I've tested this like 100 times. <laughs> <laughs> um, and similarly, I, go, I can do the same thing with Bernard at Bitnob, right? And, and Bitnob is a Nigerian-based exchange. And just like that, I, I just sent him 1,000 sats. Didn't ask him for anything. I just, just sent it. And this is the same user experience of sending a message on your favorite chat, right? So let's go even further. Bipa is a Bitcoin Lightning Network exchange in Brazil. They also have a Lightning address interface. So again, with the aim of improving user experience, the Zebedee app now has a linked account system where you can enter your Beepa Lightning address and say hit link, and now you are two taps away from making global transfers from your Zebedee US account to your Beepa Brazil account, right? And that settles instantaneously over the Lightning network. Right? Beepa actually took it further. And, and the beauty of standards and open source standards is that people can take your, your, your invention and run with it. Beepa now has a feature that allows you to toggle in their app. If I receive money to my Beepa Lightning address in Bitcoin, I want it to automatically sell it for, Bit, for Brazilian reais and deposit it in my bank account. Right? So now I have a Lightning address that I can put anywhere, and anyone in the world can make payments to and through my provider, I can automatically receive that as Brazilian reais in my bank account. Magic, right? That's, that's the future of payments that we were looking for. Let's take it even further, Bitnob. Bitnob, again, Bernard from Bitnob is a great friend of mine, and uh, they just recently released their business APIs, right? APIs for business users to, to uh, interact with Bitcoin and Lightning, and in that, their APIs support Lightning addresses. So Ejara is a fintech company based out of, out of Nigeria, and they utilize Bitnob uh, on their back end. And so just like that, Bitnob users and Ejara users are now interoperable because they can send from one another. But again, the beauty of protocols is network effects. Just like that, Bitnob users can now send to Zebedee users, and Zebedee users can send to Ejara users. I don't even, I've never even seen the Ejara app, and I can send money to it, right? Um, this is very powerful. So integrating Lightning Address, or any protocol for its matter, but integrating Lightning Address means you integrate it once in your platform, in your, in your provider platform, and then you connect to any of the other services, right? And we're talking wallets, exchanges, podcasting services, whatever you can think of. So this is now the vision, right? The vision is it does not matter where you are in the world, it does not matter what service you're using, we're all interoperable, right? Zebedee in the United States, users from Zebedee in the United States can send to Beepa users in Brazil, which can then send to Bitnob users in Nigeria, which can send to NOAA users in the UK, right? And because this is entirely based on open source interoperable systems, Bitcoin is open source money, Lightning is open source payments network on top of Bitcoin, and now Lightning Address allows users of those providers to interoperate while maintaining the best user experience that we can provide. And I think it's important to highlight that this is all open source. You can self-host everything. I want to go back to the email service provider. You can self-host your emails, right? You can run that yourself. You can run your Bitcoin Core node at home. You can run your Lightning Network node at home. You can run your Lightning Address plugin at home. You can have it entirely self-hosted. And that means that from day zero, you, self-hosting everything in your basement, are fully interoperable with users of major corporations. Right? In the world where institutions adopt this, it doesn't matter if I'm self-hosting it or you're using one of the biggest banks in the world. If we speak the same language, we can interact with one another. The future of payments must be built 
on true global interoperability across users and providers, not just providers. And they must rely on the same base money, right? And how do we get there? We have open source interoperable money. Check, Bitcoin. Global, digital, fast, scarce. We have an open source interoperable payments network, Lightning, instantaneous, decentralized, beautiful. And now we have this user layer that allows for the interoperability between providers, right? And that's also open source, and that's Lightning address. So through com combination of Bitcoin, Lightning, and Lightning address, we can really, really, truly achieve the user experience that we so desire, and that to us is what the future of payments is. Thank you very much. <laughs>